Hello and welcome back to PAX Prime Post Show with me, Dar Tebbers. And me, Das Tebbers. And you can probably tell just from the sound that we are still recovering from our PAX Pox. <laughs> yeah, it was disgusting, it was painful, it was... Well, miserable. It was, it wasn't painful, it was, it was miserable. painful for me. Yeah. You didn't get the body aches. Yeah, anyway, we won't go too deeply into that. You don't want to know. Um, yeah, so now that this video is going up, things will sort of slowly return to normal, only to go completely off kilter again because of Eurogamer, but whatever. We are here to talk about indies because that's pretty much what PAX Prime has be well, no, PAX Prime hasn't become, but it should become. It was what enticed me. I spent more time there than I did anywhere else on the floor. Yeah, and, and the thing is, it's, it's a consumer show, but... Really, they had Comcast as a booth. Why did you have Comcast as a booth? Why why not another game company there? Because, I'm sorry, Comcast sucks. I know, because they are my internet provider. They suck. They're terrible. But they don't need to be a PAX Prime. We all know about the internet, dang it. We're all nerds. And if you're watching this, you know about the internet because, well, you're on the internet. Yeah, okay. You about <laughs> covered it. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the indies. There was a massive presence. Um, the Indie Mega Booth had more games in it, I think, than the rest of the main floor. Well, yeah, but they were crammed into a small little area. It it felt like walking the farmer's market. Yeah, and then there were more indies up on the sixth floor, and there were some indies over by the Machinima Booth. And it was crazy. There was, a, there was quite a variety, but there were a lot of platformers. The platformers seem to be sort of the indie specialty, and I sort of understand why, because they are both easy to code because they're two-dimensional, and they're hard to code because there's precision when you're platforming. Yeah, yeah, phasing through the edge corner is just too frustrating. Right. So let's let's just go ahead and jump right in because there's a huge number of indies, and we need, I, yeah, we need to go. Indies, yes. <laughs> let's start with Windforge. Windforge. Terraria with air ships and flying whales. Or air whales and flying ships. Yes, that too. <laughs> um, you played this, and it felt, they even said it was very Terraria-esque. It felt like Terraria. I mean, the, the build, the design, the look, well, the build and interaction. It definitely had a little bit of a, what is it, steampunk that has more airships? Yes. It definitely had more of a steampunk feel and design to it, but I'll be honest. I well, you've seen Dare play Terraria. You've not seen me play Terraria because I know I'm rubbish at it. Yeah, she's not willing to try. <laughs> I <laughs> Though, try. Yeah, I mean, I think it hasn't. I like the concept. Like everything is destructible. You can kill a whale and then turn the whale into your airship. I wonder in the long run if that's going to rot away, but I'm not touching it. Right. I'm not touching it. It's inter It looks really interesting, but that wasn't the only Terraria-inspired thing that was there in Indies. The other one was Edge of Space, which was Terraria in space with sharks with freaking lasers on their heads. No, nah, that's a rocket-boosted shark. Well, he's a, he's a space shark with rocket boosters and a laser on his head. Yeah, and a flip-top head. He well, looks aggressive, man. That thing's cool. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I played a little bit of it. I couldn't figure it out for the life of me, but... That's because you stink at Terraria. Yes. It's in beta now, so they're still working on it. Yeah, it's on Steam. It's on Early Access. Keep an ear out on Twitter because I have probably a handful of Edge of Space 50% off codes that I'll be giving away between now and Eurogamer, basically. Um, I have a bunch of different things that will show up on Twitter randomly. As we dig them out of the pile in the floor. Right. But we did uh, send Edge of Space over to um, a friend of yours that is a Terraria head. Yes. And I think he reported back that it was hard. <laughs> but very fun. He, he seems to enjoy it, so. Right. So there, there is that, I guess. Um, what else do we have? Oh, we have um, Armoreo. Armeo? Armeo. Or Armello. I'm not sure how you want to spell it. I like Armeo myself, but I should have probably asked the dude when I talked to him. Right. It's um, Step into the Fairy Tale Animal Kingdom. 
an experience adventure that combines RPG elements with strategic play of cards and board games. And it was tablet-based, which... Uh, I can sort of understand. They said it, they were going to make it first on iOS, then move it to Android, and then move it to Steam. You tried it. It was like a cross between um, any tabletop game coupled in with like Magic the Gathering type booster spells. It was sort of Magic the Gathering booster spells, but also a little bit of like Civilization V because everything was, was um, uh, hexagonal and all your movements. Mm, yeah. Um, but it, it, I'm like, Civilization is cool and everything, but I can see where Civilization V would work on the iOS because you just drag. Because after playing this game, you just drag your finger and the critter walks, and that's kind of cool. I can understand the appeal. And you say critter. I do. The game actually uses animals. Uh, humanized animals. Right. So, so it's uh, Civilization with furries? Yes, Civilization with Furries. It's Furries, well, except for the city building. All right, <clears throat> so that was uh, that one. Next one was Never Ending Nightmares, which was interesting. Um, it is a horror game. Psychological horror, even. Yes, and it's based on the developer's actual real-life struggle with mental illness. So it's, it's sort of this developer ha suffered mental illness, uh, I believe OCD and paranoia, depression was what we were told and decided that one of the ways they could sort of get it out there was just create a game around the, the visions and the horror they had and they created this game. The style, I think, is... It's almost got this children's book sketchy. And I think that's going to be an interesting contrast to it being, well, nightmares. Right. I really like the style of it. It feels... I don't know. I fail at words right now. How does I English? Yeah, and I do know that there is a demo available, and I probably will go grab it and play a little bit um, as a spotlight at some point in time. <laughs> you will. I will not. I fail at words, and I fail to play horror games. Yes. Uh, Reyes. So some of the indie get titles were already released. Reyes, Papers, Please. Uh, those are the two I can think of off the top of my head. Mm. Um, Reyes, of course, Dan over at Nerd Cube did a cover, uh, did a cover, did a bit on Reyes. It's world building with monsters. World building with giants. Yes. You said you wanted it, so we'll probably have to get it. It reminds me of black and white. In the way you build the world and make your people happy. But without playing it, I can't really compare it. And there was always a bit of a line there, which is kind of funny. When even the indies have the lines. Stanley Parable. Uh, <laughs> you said it was first person with a fourth wall that's only in your head. Oh, yeah. That one looked interesting. It was uh, first person, fully 3D. Um, based off of, I think the guy first did with Half-Life mods is where he drew his inspiration and then went on into the game. I mean, th that's the extent that I could get from it, honestly. It looks like it's going to be interesting. Right. And and he did say that, you know, the, the original mod is still out there and he said, don't even bother, <clears throat> which of course you would expect from somebody who's going to try to sell a game, but still. Well, it's like I learned what I'm doing. Right. This will be better. Yes. Um, and then uh, we're gonna we're gonna deviate from the mega booth and run up to the to the sixth floor really quick to the PAX 10 booth. Talk about a scapegoat too. <laughs> purple with, goat, orange mouse. Right. We call it a purple goat puzzle platformer with an orange mouse. <laughs> it just looks it looks interesting. It's very much a puzzle platformer that uh, just from watching people play it because again that one had a line too. From watching people play it, there were a lot of in-game dynamics you just had to get used to. The timing, the methods, and what kind of blocks, materials, walls, enemies. And keep track of that. But it looked like it would be both maddening and very fun. Right. It didn't have, like, it didn't have terrible you failed physics is what I call it. It's, it's when games punish you terribly for failing. Right. As a platformer, it was very much a, a very quick platformer in that respect. Yeah, it seems to take uh, the puzzles or a room at a time. 
So if you yeah. fail, you start back at the beginning of the room. Right, right. Um, and we'll stay up there, actually. I don't even think I put it on the list that we're looking at. But Gunpoint um, was al is also already released. <clears throat> and I played Gunpoint. The best part is we have the composer sitting there next to us. So <laughs> when, I, when I die, he would play on his trumpet. So it was hilarious. They did not leave the trumpet sounds in the game, which is kind of sad. They said they took it out because it didn't fit, but in all honesty, I wish that was something that was just, you know, left in there that you can toggle off in the menu. Right. Yeah. Or maybe mod it back in. <laughs> right. And that one also is another one of those platformers that doesn't have terrible failure physics because it takes a, a save every five seconds. Right. So you fail, you can back up five seconds or ten seconds or fifteen seconds or restart the level if you want, which is really cool. It looked like a puzzle platformer with spy espionage action. Yes. And okay. a lot of face punchy. That was just you. It's supposed to also be stealth. It was cool to face punchy. <laughs> uh, let's do Pandora, Purge of Pride. Purge of Pride. Yeah. This, this was, well, th this one was actually in the indie mini booth, which within the mega booth was the mini booth, which was like uh, 12 computers set up and people rented for a couple days or a day or the whole show and they literally had a monitor. They had a monitor, a mouse, and a keyboard. They had to bring in their own computer and and that was it. So it allowed really small indie devs to get in the PAX Prime where it's prohibitively expensive to get into one of the main booths. Right, or to get in for the whole time and all that. Right. Now you played Purge of Pride. I played Purge of Pride. Uh First person, very puzzle. Um, it uh, obviously fully 3D graphics if it's first person. Huh. It felt a lot like Mist in that it gave you a few hints and then otherwise you're like, have fun, go figure it out. Right. And you guys know how I feel about Mist lately. So anything that harkens back to that automatically gets brownie points with me. And just so everyone knows, her sin is pride, according to the shirt she got. <laughs> yeah, if you played, you could get one of the shirts, and they had them in different colors corresponding to in-game mechanics, and it was all of the deadly sins, and of course I took pride. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Apotheon. Apotheon. Uh, Greek urn art game Castlevania thing, is I think uh. what you had me write down. <laughs> yeah, it. I didn't get to play it because it looked like a platformer that played. It reminded me of Castlevania, in in its in its mechanics, in its appearance. It seriously looked like art off the side of a Greek urn, the black figure type. If you're an art history nerd out there, which I am, a little bit, but it looked like it had a really good feel for the game and it had very clean graphics. Of course, drawing off of that, it's gonna make clean graphics. Um, I'll admit Castlevania style games aren't my thing, but it caught my eye and it's art alone. Another game that caught not your eye, but also your laughter and everything else <laughs> was um, Foul Play. Oh my gosh. A, vaud a vaudevillian <laughs> stage brawler. Exactly, exactly. It was wonderful. Um, it was set up for two-player at the time. It is it is a brawler. It reminds me very much of a Flash game, kind of like Castle Crashers, because it's side-scrolling. There's enemies all over the place, and you can pretty much button mash and get away with it. Um, it was doing co-op play when I got there, and some other gal was playing, and by about halfway through the first level, we were already cracking jokes and having a grand old time juggling the combos and tossing enemies to each other so it's easy to pick up and play because I'll admit I'm not good at Castle Crashers but an aspect that the game did is it's it's on stage you don't have health it, the whole thing is posed as a show so you're there to entertain the crowd so the flasher you can make the fight the better and just so everyone knows that's watching the video, she's the one with the uh, broom. She's the chimney sweep dude. <laughs> yeah, one thing that was underneath it, they had instructions on the game. And when it just says how to fight like a sir, I had to kind of elbow the dude and get a good picture of that. Yes. 
Um, Let's see. What else we got? <clears throat> Guncraft, which I have a, I have this, and I don't remember actually playing it, so I'll figure it out later. It looked like Minecraft. <clears throat> yeah, it Minecraft like, with weapons. Yeah, I don't remember playing it. I don't have any video of it, so that either means I played it while I'd wandered away from you, or I didn't play it and I somehow ended up with a code for it. I don't, oh, that was me. I'm sorry. I don't know. That, someone handed it to me. I'm like, okay, free stuff. Thank you. Okay, yes. And um, we also had, there was also <clears throat> Contrast. Ooh, yeah. And and a couple different people talked about Contrast. Um, it was talked about at the Game Station podcast with TB and uh, Jesse Cox and um, Dodger. It was also talked about in the Giant Bomb panel as well. Um, it is a, you are a 3D person or your 2D imaginary friend as a shadow. And it is a mashup of 1920s burlesque and 1940s noir. Ooh, that sounds like a... Yeah, like you're either the 1940s 3D noir or it's 1920s burlesque. It's really interesting. And it's a 3D, 2D puzzle platformer. So you'll be... 3D, and then you have to make a move that you can't do normally, so you turn into your 2D imaginary friend, and you can come out of your 2D imaginary state, because you can run on the wall as a shadow on another shadow. Yeah, it gets you up up from ground level to higher levels if you need to get up there. Right, and it looks like an absolutely amazing concept. So, I, I think that's a really, really neat title. Uh, Dead State. Dead State. The zombie survival RPG. Right. It's the human side of the zombie apocalypse. So instead of killing zombies, it's focused on your people. I think we have enough games out there to establish that if you put enough guns in people's hands and survivors' hands, they're going to kill the zombies. It's given. But uh, this game kind of focuses on keeping, keeping morale up, keeping people alive. It focuses on your safe house. Right. It was an extremely early alpha. I mean, extremely early alpha. And you could see huge frame rate drops and, and stutters and hiccups in the game. <clears throat> but the concept was there. And, and that was what was important, the concept. With enough time, I think it will become gel into a good game. Yeah. Oh, up on the, what was it, sixth floor? Sixth floor. Back up to the sixth floor again, to a lovely thing called Contraption Maker. It was, uh, it's a, it's a Rube Goldberg simulator, basically. I mean, you get these, all sorts of parts, whether they seem like they should be out of a machine or not. Everything from a cat, from a cat to a blimp, to a blender, to a fan, to pipes, Whatever. balls, yeah. cans, you name it. And you make your contraptions that has, it has a challenge mode where either from the game or from downloaded content, there is a challenge, basically. Get the cat or the dude or this part to some other part of the contraption. And I found it a little bit hard to pick up and run with, but I have the patience to play. I'm like, that seems like it would be really fun. Yeah, I can see this ending up in our library eventually. It looks like a really interesting game. Definitely something you could do, like, um, if if uh, me and Doss maybe make challenges for each other or you know uh, you can make one for stock up <laughs> <laughs> the answer will be to set it on fire <laughs> no that will be his that will be his first thing to do <laughs> is to set it on fire <laughs> or the end has to be a beacon oh yeah was there a beacon i think there was a beacon there were lots and lots of parts i didn't get a chance to scroll through all of them because they're like here have sandbox mode I'm like oh my god too many parts Whew. What else? What else? We've got Geldia. Yeah, you played Geldia, and it definitely was something that you liked, and I was like, meh. You're like, eh. Yeah, well, it, uh, it felt like an overhead. There we go. <laughs> that That's how you described it? No, that's it how you described it to me on the plane, was a nouveau Zelda Final Fantasy mashup. It did feel like that. It had the... It didn't have battle scenes. It was an, an adventure map, so that was cool. But you were able to customize different types of equipment to give yourself different skills in dealing with specific monsters or different buffs for different weapons. So it definitely lets you customize your play experience with it. 
And this one is... It is on Steam. Oh, it's on Steam Greenlight. Yes. So, yeah. That's going to be fun. Um, I don't know if he had it set up strangely, but he had it there with a controller. Personally, I prefer a keyboard, but we know it supports controllers. Yes. Um, another that another indie title is sort of an indie title. Um, I call it sort of an indie title because not a lot of people played it, and um, this is the same group of guys who brought who are uh, were also showing off Edge of Space and Guncraft. They also had Van Helsing out. Um, I think this is Van Helsing Two. Uh, it looked sort of it looked like Dota only not meaning. It had the Dota feel, sort of that isometric view, Welcome, but it wasn't Dota because it wasn't online and it wasn't like esport esque. So it's kind of like single player Dota. Yeah, sort of like single player Dota. Your own secret lair well, I've never played Dota, so I can't really make a comparison on that. Is there any other games you could compare that to? You keep your isometric. No. Fighting lots of enemies. No. Diablo doesn't do that. I've never played I Diablo. Guess, yeah, it would be sort of like Diablo, but. Mm, yeah, sort of Diablo, but not Diablo at the same time. And defenses. Mechanics, but not look. Yes. Okay, there we go. I mean, it felt it felt almost like MMO because you had a bar at the bottom for all your spells, and it, it felt like it had all the feel of an MMO, mm -hmm. but it was more of a brawler because you just went out and you just started beating critters down. And But it wasn't because you weren't online and you weren't with anybody, so you were by yourself. So sort of like harkening back to the early Diablo, very first Diablo, to some degree. Here you go. Mugenics! It wasn't actually at the show. This is from the guys who, who brought us Super Meat Boy. They, we asked them about it. They said it wasn't right, quite in the state that they wanted to bring it to the show, but it is coming. It is called Mugenics. Um, this is a, a grab of the cover of the comic book they gave us. Um, yeah, derive your own thing from the weird cat on the front. That's... Well, no, they give a really good summary here. Look oh. at this one. This pretty much summarizes it. Okay, there we go. There. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on from eugenics before it gets any weirder. <laughs> Luft trousers. Not Luft trousers. Not Lu I thought she said Luft trousers. I was like, what? But no, Luft trousers. My first thing was to ask her. So what does rousers mean? Because I know Luft means air. She's like, it's made up. I even looked it up and I couldn't find any translation. If anybody knows. Yeah. Right. It's a 2D plane shooter. Allows you to go around in circles. Major customization to the plane. Multi-directional flight. Ability to fly underwater. If you have the underwater engine. Yes. Which actually lets you dodge most of the fire. <laughs> that is true as well. Um, the, the game also changes its music based on your orientation, whether you're firing, whether you're not, whether you're getting hit, how low in health you are. So the, the soundtrack is very dynamic with it, which is really nice. I usually don't like these kinds of games, but I could see me definitely derping a little bit with it because, well, I think it's the free flight because otherwise it's just you have to left, right, dodge bullets, hold down the shoot button. Right. Uh, another one that we saw was Stunt Runner. Yeah, you guys saw that one in our, in our spots. Spot, spot, sight, sights and sounds. There we go. Yes. Um, stunt runner, the, the mentally damaged stunt man that you just have to give him a sequence and he runs the sequence. And it's sort of, it's sort of like Contraption Maker on a smaller scale. It is because the guy's so damaged that he just runs straight. So you have to give him props and everything to get him up, down, turn around, over a gap, you name it. Right. So it looks really interesting. It's still in its early stage. So uh, hopefully it, it makes it to publication and we can play Stunt Runner. Because I think it was worthwhile. Yeah. One thing I also have to give the dude props for in making it is his, uh, his training levels. They taught you how to play the game by letting you play the game rather than giving you a text wall. I love a game that shows you how to play rather than tells you. Yes, that is true as well. Um, Papers, Please was there, as I mentioned before. I don't think we need to say much more than Papers, Please was there. And we like it. Access granted. <laughs> All right, let's talk about Crypt of the Necrodancer. Oops, 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 oops. 
the weirdest game there, I think. It's, it, wins the, it wins my award for the weirdest game. Most unsuspected. It's like the Spanish Inquisition game. Yes. The best part is it gives you a use for a dance pad. It does. Or a stinky. Yes. If you want to try it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, it's a 2D dance game. 2D overhead, very sprite-based dungeon. It's like kind of a dungeon crawler. Yes, and when you encounter enemies, it becomes disco time. It does. It changes the floor for battles. Yes, it it was a lot of people. I mean, the line was ridiculous. A lot of people, again, a giant bomb, and everyone on the Game Station podcast, and several other people I talked to were all like, "Have you seen Crypt of the Necrodancer?" I mean, it was sort of like the talk of the show. Everybody was like, "Dude, go over and look at Crypt of the Necrodancer." Yeah, it's. It's not something you expect. I mean, it's a dungeon crawler with techno music. Yes. And flashy lights. Yes, it was It was actually really awesome. Uh, you could play it on a keyboard if you really wanted to, but... Or if you don't have a dance pad. Right. Um, so it, it is convertible over to a regular computer, but, I mean, you've got to, you got to imagine doing this in your living room floor with a bunch of friends over. It would just be a party. Yeah, well, also don't don't assume just because it's doing a dance pad that it's automatically uh, DDR hard mode. It's got a pretty stable beat. You don't have to do any acrobatics. You can control everything from that. You do have some magic, which is the only thing that requires two buttons at once. So that's that's the extent of your coordination, really. Otherwise, it's, you know, up, down, left, right. Have fun. Right. I think there's a few others that we pr- we probably saw, we probably missed for one reason or another because at some point we were running out of like, well, one, my battery was dying on the camera because I didn't charge it the night before, which I've learned my lesson on that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And um, also you, you can only stand in so many queues and, and push your way through so many people to talk to the devs before you just give up and go and get something good to eat at a cafe. Yeah, the and the mini booth was constantly turning over. So, right. like there was, uh, Total Biscuit talked about it. There was a game the first day in the mini booth that had dragon flight mechanics. Yeah, we never found that. We couldn't were find it. For it too. I went. I I went and checked the name. Mm-hmm. It did. It was not there the the second or third day. It was a one day only. Oh. So it was one of those things where if you knew it was there for just a day, you'd run to it, but we didn't, so. And there was, there was I know there was lots we missed, because every time we went by the mini booth, I was peeking in there. I saw one thing that was, uh, was a cannon fight game. It felt like, uh, can't think of the name. Cannon fodder? No, that was the name of the game. Yeah, can, was it? I think so. <laughs> I'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. So there, there were a lot of games, which is really exciting. We have a huge indie crop coming. There is a lot of platformers, um, some really interesting things coming. And I love it because it means that we have something new, unique, and unexpected. And I do like that. Um, it's not, it doesn't all have to be a repeat of something that's already out there. One thing that I think both me and DOS noticed to some degree was the, that there seems to be more of a focus on iOS tablet games. It's the next big thing. Well, and here's the thing. When we were flying back, I was telling Doss, I hate to see that because it's going to get beaten up in the, in the tablet marketplace because people who own Apple tablets expect to pay 99 cents for something. And if they have to pay more than that, they don't care. And you can't make a game on 99 cent sales. You have to microtransaction. And I hate that. And then it gets to Steam, where we're willing to pay five bucks for it, but by that time the developer's given up, and so we never see the game in Steam. So I say that, but then we were sick, and I was, I was laying downstairs, and I was like, you know, I would just love to have a tablet right now, and I would totally play me some Amar- Amareo, or Amarillo, whatever. Armeo. Armeo. I would totally sit here and just play some game like that on a tablet, because having a laptop is just not conducive when you're just like Ugh. so I sort when of when you were death warmed over yes I was death warmed I was crypt of the necro dancer only I, there was no dancing yeah only seriously out of rhythm yes so I I'm sort of conflicted I sort of see the, the appeal but at the same time indie devs please consider PC people we, we're willing to pay for these things we understand it we understand the work that goes into it 
and uh, and that that I'm gonna screw up the name again. Armario. Armeo. Armeo. Thank you. They were what? Two years in the making and still two years to go. They thought. I think that's what they said. Yeah. It it was just they they have to create all the decks for all the characters and they haven't gotten around to it yet. I'm just like, oh man, this is gonna so suck if they release it for a buck ninety nine and iOS users don't buy it and then the game gets canned. And they wouldn't bother to port it. Right. And I'm just like, oh, why? Well, you could see it was two years in. The graphics were... It was beautiful. Crisp and clean. Yes. Lovely done. I like the colors. Yeah. Um, what's your game of the show? Oh. We've come to that time where I have We've to put her on her spot. Time. I don't like being on the spot. Me with game of the show, man, it's, it's like... You have to ask me that based on what mood. I mean, if I'm gonna just gonna derp around with friends, then I am totally gonna fight like a sir and play. Um, forgot the name. Foul play. Foul play. If I'm in the mood to not sleep, <laughs> the never-ending nightmare sounds good. Um, oh, if I want to challenge myself, contraption maker, stunt runner, those would be fun. If I want something that's gonna take me a while to do. Then, um, it'll be some zombie RPG. I'm, I'm horrible at remembering the names. I mean, hmm. So, in, in other words, yes. Game of the show is yes, please. <laughs> a, a soft allusion to the fact I told her she couldn't pick papers, please. <laughs> <laughs> we already know I like papers, please. But a lot of this other stuff still has other things to offer that papers, please, doesn't. Right. Doesn't mean I'd give up papers, please, for it. So in other words, what we're saying, Indie Devs, is yes. Yes, thank you. Keep doing it. <laughs> I will say that my game of the show right now, based purely on the mechanics and the look of the game, would be Contrast. I really want Contrast. I want to see how this game plays. You didn't get to play much. So I want to see how this game plays out. I want to see how this mechanic evolves, its ability to jump 3D to 2D. And I want to see the story evolve. You know, this, this 1940s um, versus 1920s. Yeah, what's the deal? How does that tie yeah, in? Yeah, the, the burlesque versus the... Um, noir. Noir. Yeah. Uh, I want to see what that is all about. So mine was definitely contrast, at least at this point. At least at this point. I love that. Yes. So yeah, more to come as these things start popping up on my channel. Right, or my channel for that matter, because you won't see Never Ending Nightmare on hers. Yeah, that's true. Although I might be back there squealing. Yes. <laughs> I don't do scary games. All right. So this is the end of the post show for us. We are done with PAX Prime 2013. Uh, we Even the PAX Pox. Yes, mostly the PAX Pox as well. So hopefully recordings will start again. There might be some delays on things making it up. Um, consider there to be a disturbance in the forest until after Eurogamer, because, well, bloody heck, that's Eurogamer. Oh, yeah, that's that's <clears throat> more traveling, more trying to get ahead, and I'm already not caught up. I think I ran out of stuff already. Yes. Well, so un until the uh, Eurogamer, I guess, uh, when we will get together again to have something like this. Are we going to be doing sights and sounds from Eurogamer? We're going to do... I don't know. It depends on the hotel internet. I'm hoping to do some stuff from London itself and then some maybe sights and sounds from Eurogamer. And I'm hoping the post show I can con the other two in as well and we can do some sort of Skype video thing. That'll be fun. Okay. So there you go. No promises, but there's a thought. There's the ideas. The, the, the moon we're shooting for. Right. So until then, this has been Derek Tebbers. And Das Tebbers. With your PAX Post Show focused on indies. The indies. Till next time. Bye. Take it easy.